Hello, everyone. My name is Al Season, and I'm the RTCA Vice President of Aviation Technology and Standards. Welcome to the second in our series of online webinars where we hear from aviation leaders who are at the forefront of our industry. Aviation is in the throes of pressures completely unforeseen just six months ago. The worldwide upheaval of the travel industry has changed many aspects of aviation, but much remains the same. Our collective drive to maintain the unparalleled safety of modern aviation continues unabated. Our speakers today represent those values, both in the breadth of their career achievements and through the inspired leadership of the organizations that they currently lead. Our very special guests today are the Honorable Robert L. Sumwalt, Chairman of the National Transportation Safety Board, Mr. Pete Bunce, President and CEO of the General Aviation Manufacturers Association, and RTCA's own Terry McVenus, President and CEO of RTCA. Included in today's webinar is the announcement of the first round of RTCA award winners for exceptional work and standards development. We normally recognize these outstanding individuals at our annual symposium luncheon. Out of an abundance of caution, our symposium was canceled for this year, yet our admiration for and desire to recognize these members could not be stopped. Selected by the leadership of their committees, these individuals also represent the spirit of our industry's push to keep safety, safety front and center. During today's webinar, if you experience technical issues, feel free to use the Q&A function to send us a question, or you can dial into the webinar with your phone using the instructions sent to you by RTCA earlier this week. We will have a Q&A chat with Chairman Sumwalt and Terry McVenus later in the program. Please use that same Q&A window to send us questions. This session is being recorded and you'll be able to view it on the RTCA webinar channel by tomorrow. You'll notice the handout section on your screen. Please check those out. They're important materials supplied by our sponsors. At this time, I'd like to introduce the, the RTCA president, Terry McVenus. Terry joined RTCA in December of 2018. He brought with him his career experiences with Boeing aircraft, the Airline Pilots Association, and as a captain with US Air. Terry, over to you. Well, thanks, Al, for that nice introduction, and welcome to all of you for our second in a series of webinars that we've titled Aviation Technology Connect. Our goal with these webinars is to allow you to hear from a variety of aviation industry leaders on a broad spectrum of topics that will educate you, further inspire you in your profession, and perhaps even evolve your thinking as to where the industry is today and where it's going in the future. Throughout the balance of this year and into next year, we're gonna be convening on this third Wednesday of each month at the same time, and we'll continue with this program series. And each webinar is gonna first focus on a primary topic, uh, and then we'll hear a, a short tech talk from one of our industry leaders who will share some of their insights with you that I know will be inspirational, strategic, or thought-provoking with the primary goal of them giving you, the audience, a, a gift of their knowledge. As I'll mention, we're also gonna be using this webinar series to acknowledge some of our special committee members from government and industry that have done some outstanding work in the development of aviation performance standards throughout this past year. I'm most grateful to our sponsors from the industry that have come forward to help us make this series happen throughout the year. Without their assistance, this webinar series would not be possible. And for days of today's event, I'm pleased to have Collins Aerospace, the National Business Aviation Association, American Airlines, the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, Garmin, and Gamma, the General Aviation Manufacturers Association, as sponsors for today's webinar. So let's get started. I'm pleased to be joined today by the Honorable Robert L. Sumwalt, Chairman of the National Transportation Safety Board. Chairman Sumwalt is someone who really needs no introduction. He's been a member of the NTSB since 2006, when he was sworn in as its 37th member of the board. And more recently, in August of 2017, he was confirmed by the United States Senate as the NTSB's chairman. I've had the distinct honor of working with Chairman Sumwalt for a little over 20 years now, collaborating with him when we were both pilots at US Airways, our work together at the Airline Pilots Association, and then again when I was with Boeing. Uh, Robert is a true advocate for safety across all the modes of transportation. 
a man of great integrity, inspiration, and a great friend. Chairman Sommel, thank you for being here today, and I'll turn it over to you. Terry, thanks so much. It's, uh, it's great to be here. It's uh, great to be invited to be a part of this. I want to thank RTCA for 85 years of bringing industry and government together to develop standards. And I'll be glad to talk uh, in a little while about some of the things that um, uh, some of the participation that the NTSB has had on some of your special committees. In any event, uh, good afternoon. I, uh, I wanted to bring you inside or take you inside the NTSB and talk to you a little bit about what we do. Uh, everybody knows that the NTSB is an accident investigation agency, but uh, there's sort of a mystique surrounding the NTSB. And I wanted to pull back the curtain, if you will, to, to kind of give you an in insider's view of what we actually do and how we go about doing our jobs. A friend of mine, Jim Schultz uh, in Texas, who's, uh, who's tuned in, uh, really helped me to develop this title, Lessons from, Ash from, from the Ashes improving transportation safety through accident investigation. And when you think about it, it's it's really ironic that our aviation system has gotten as safe as it has been. Our entire transportation system, for that matter, has gotten safe because of accidents. And the idea, of course, is to do an effective accident investigation so that we can learn from it and keep it from happening again. So, uh, as I think everyone here knows, we uh, NTSB has the statutory responsibility to investigate all civil aviation accidents in this country. Uh, this is a the B-29 that crashed in early October in uh, uh, Winter Rocks, Bradley Field, Hartford, Connecticut. Um, we also have the responsibility to investigate selected rail accidents this is one that happened just about 20 miles from my home in Columbia, South Carolina, an Amtrak crash. We also investigate um, selected highway crashes. This was the limousine that crashed almost two years ago, uh, October of two years ago, in Harry, New York, just right outside of Albany, killed 20 people. The We investigate marine accidents. This is the conception, the dive boat that caught fire and claimed the lives of 34 people on this past Labor Day. And also we do pipeline accidents. I realize that pipeline, not a lot of people are traveling by pipeline these days, but, um, but pipeline is a means of transportation. We are transporting products through the pipeline that we might be uh, otherwise transporting in, in a rail tank car or um, highway vehicles. We have five board members uh, appointed by the president, nominated by the president, confirmed by the Senate. And um, the real backbone of the agency would be our investigative staff. We have 400 employees at the NTSB. Most of those our investigative staff. We certainly have other ancillary functions that are necessary for running a federal agency, such as uh, uh, the chief financial officer's office. Uh, we've got uh, uh, hiring, HR, we've got legal, but most of our staff were pretty heavily uh, weighted towards investigative staff. Really talented, bright, motivated employees. We have a 24-7 uh, uh, response operations center. Um, here it is uh, actually on the day of a, of a balloon accident that happened in Lockhart, Texas, 40 years ago, July the 30th of 2016. And uh, this is staffed around the clock. And they are the means that will, in many cases, we're going to learn about something happening out there just by monitoring media, whether it's broadcast media, social media, the internet. Um, and so we, uh, uh, that's what they do. They're monitoring. Occasionally somebody might actually pick up, pick up the phone and notify us of an accident, but uh, they will get the duty officer on the phone. We will then determine what the response will be. Um, get the, like I say, get the right people together and then they will start making arrangements for transportation, hotels, whatever whatever needs to be done. 
if it's during business hours, we would gather in our situation room. If it's non-business hours, which seem, things seem to happen uh, on the weekends or at night, uh, but uh, if it's if it's non non-business hours, we'll just simply get on a call. We have various calls. The first one is called a chairman's call, just to um, start deciding what our general response will be. And of course, not all accidents receive the same level of response. If we have a a single of a, a single engine uh, plane that crashes in a cornfield in Iowa, we might only send one investigator. On the other hand, we might send a full go team out of Washington. There was a mid-air collision uh, two weekends ago of a quarter lane Idaho. We sent uh, two investigators um, just for uh, COVID protection purposes. They uh, actually traveled and they 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 drove from the Seattle office and in two, two separate cars. Uh, we are very cautious about making sure we are taking the proper precautions during this horrible, horrible, uh, deadly pandemic. Sometimes we will drive, sometimes we will uh, fly commercial, and at other times we may ride on a government plane. Uh, the government plane is not just a luxury, it's a very efficient uh, and effective work tool. We can get a lot done on the airplane while we're transporting uh, to the uh, site. Talk about what our plan is going to be. Here's Bill English, who's one of our investigators in charge, um, talking to me. I'm the board member on scene, so I'm taking notes. Uh, and then Bill is on the telephone, coordinating with the uh, local law enforcement agencies for once, once we get there. If we do send a, a major team, a GO team out of Washington, um, we will form various groups, various investigators, investigative groups made up of specialists in each area, power plant structures, systems, uh, and each of those experts in their respective domains will lead that particular part of the investigation. This was the UPS crash in Birmingham, Alabama in 2013. And this was Asiana, which occurred six weeks earlier in uh, San Francisco. Of course, finding the black boxes, uh, sometimes the black boxes are, they are actually painted orange, of course, uh, but in the particular case of this UPS crash, they were black because they were charred. But naturally, finding the black boxes is a very high priority of, uh, of, of the investigative staff. We do use drones. Uh, drones are not just simply toys. Uh, we find them to be extremely effective in helping us to document the wreckage. We can use photogrammetry, overlay, overlay with uh, ortho mosaic. Uh, images and uh, here's a case where where we we measured it with the drone uh, and we measured it with the measuring wheel and we found that the in identifying these prop slash marks we we could uh, um, we could measure it within one tenth of an inch between actual tape measure measurements and the using a drone. So, um, you know, it's very, it can be very effective. We can go out and map an entire accident site within, within 30 or 45 minutes that otherwise might take a half a day. We have uh, uh, two different labs in, in Washington. People hear about the labs and I love to show the labs around when, we, when we're having visitors. Um, it's one of the things I really love doing. This happens to be part of our uh, recorder's lab and let me take you inside one of the rooms of that. Here's uh, one of our investigators taking apart. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what that is, but he's taking it apart. And uh, we have the ability to do sound spectrum analysis. Um, uh, yesterday, we had a board meeting about a, an Atlas Air crash, and there was a click that they wanted to identify what that click sound in the cockpit was. And they were able to confirm uh, just what they had suspected. The click was the activation of the go-around switch on the throttle quadrant. So um, now the the cockpit voice recorder, the actual recording itself, and any video recording 
taken from inside an airplane or uh, inside a, uh, the cab of a, of a vehicle or, or a locomotive, that is, those are the most protected things that we have, the most sensitive things that we have. We buy, are prohibited by law from releasing the actual audio content of a cockpit, vo uh, cockpit uh, voice recorder. So we will release a public a written transcript, but never the actual audio. Now, sometimes you'll hear audio, which would be the, the tower to the airplane controller. You'll hear the voice of the pilot, but that's because it's being broadcast over the airways. The actual CVR itself, we, we uh, do not release that, the actual audio portion. Instead, what we do, we form a group which would be the FAA, I'm sorry, the NTSB specialists. We would have various uh, party members, the FAA, uh, pilots union, the manufacturer of the aircraft, the operator of the aircraft. Uh, all of those would gather uh, to actually listen to the recording. And it's done the old fashioned way. You play the tape, they listen to it, say, what did he say? I'm not real sure, let's back it up. Play it again. And then as they do that, the, um, the NTSB specialist will type out the transcript and everybody gets to see what he or she is typing. Human factors is an area that I'm uh, particularly interested in and we certainly are interested in the human machine interface. There's a lot of ways that our human performance Investigators will get information, cell phone records. Everybody has a cell phone nowadays. We saw a crash uh, a few years ago where the pilot said he was asleep. Uh, but I've heard of people um, sleepwalking and sleep talking, but I've never heard of anybody sleep texting. And we had uh, text messages going from that, uh, from that pilot while he was sleeping all throughout the rest period. So that sort of tells us that uh, maybe he was not sleeping. Uh, but there's a lot of records that we can get to sort of help to piece this mystery back together. Hotel records, every time you enter a hotel room, there's a key swipe and there's a record of that. Now, the board members are not accident investigators and oftentimes when I go on to go on an accident site, uh, I'll be giving a press conference and the media is going to say, well, Chairman Robert Sumwalt is leading the investigation. And that's not true at all. Board members do not lead investigations. We go to the accident site to do three things, really to be the public face of the investigation. That's the real thing that we do. And that consists of three components. One is doing the, the, the media briefings. Another is meeting with elected officials. And another is to is to meet with the families. Um, one of our core values at the NTSB is transparency. And we believe that the traveling public or the American public needs to understand that there is a competent, thorough investigation that's taking place. And that's why we, we, we do press conferences and we try to release information, factual information uh, in the early days so that well, people will um, have an idea of what's going on. The purpose of this slide is to say that, so the board members don't lead investigations. We leave that to the investigations, to the investigators. So once I leave an accident, the next time I see that, have any involvement with that investigation again, is when about five weeks before it goes to a board meeting. At that time, the staff will present to us, they'll send us a, a draft report, they'll email us a draft report. Each of the board members will look over the report, study it, and then we will meet individually with staff. I'll meet with the staff, the vice chairman will meet with the staff, we do it one-on-one, -on -one, one, one board member per meeting. And uh, we'll go through and, uh, and ask questions and maybe say, well, I don't agree with this. And we'll write a memo to offer some suggestions for the report. And then staff will absorb all of those memos, all of those comments, and then come back with a, with a final draft. Uh, as in the case of yesterday's board meeting, 
Uh, we got the draft a few weeks ago and uh, we went to a board meeting. Now, unfortunately, the board meeting did not look like this. This would be in our, in our boardroom. And I wish we were in our boardroom, but of course, due to the pandemic, we are doing uh, board meetings virtually these days. But nevertheless, we can get it. We can get it done in the board meeting, whether it's virtual or whether it's actually in our board boardroom itself. Uh, the staff will lay out the investigation. Again, each of the board members will have carefully prepared. We will have read the report several times. We will have gotten into the public docket. We will have read the party submissions. And as once uh, John Lawler, who was a former board member, told me years ago, he said that I try to get ready for a board meeting like I would prepare for a type rating oral. And as a pilot who did uh, a lot of uh, check rides over the years and who had a lot of check rides over the years, I can certainly relate to that analogy uh, of, of getting ready for a check ride. In fact, night before last, I, I sort of had that, that unsettled feeling uh, that I would have before the night of a check ride. Bottom line is staff lays out the report. The board will question the staff. Uh, at the end of the day, we will have voted on and hopefully approved the findings, the probable cause, the recommendations, and finally the report overall. As I mentioned, yesterday's board meeting concerned uh, this aircraft here operated by Atlas Air. Uh, Terry will be glad to talk about, uh, about the board meeting yesterday. Um, this accident occurred February the 23rd of last year. I was the board member on scene for that. And here's a video that I took. This video was taken um, the day after the crash. It crashed going into the plane crash going into Houston. It's hard to believe that a big old a uh, big old airplane like that could get reduced to something like that. And uh, unfortunately, the three, uh, the two crew members and a uh, jump seat rider, all three of them, of course, and unfortunately perished in that crash. Uh, so we'll be glad to talk about what happened there. It crashed into Trinity Bay. So in, in the nutshell, uh, that's what we do at the NTSB. And uh, Terry, thanks for the opportunity to, to uh, start out with that and i look forward to, uh, to chatting with you well, thanks robert uh, for those of you that may have joined us a little late you've been hearing from the honorable robert l Sumwalt, chairman of the ntsb and uh, robert's been kind enough to stick around for a few questions and so i'll start and then we'll see if we have any from the audience well you had mentioned the uh the atlas 3591 uh, accident and uh breaking news from yesterday the board meeting you want to expand a little bit on some of the findings, uh, lessons learned, probable cause, that sort of thing. Yeah, the long and the short of it is, is that uh, we have a, uh, a first officer who has, uh, uh, has had performance uh, deficiencies throughout his entire career. Uh, he concealed from Atlas Air uh, two of the previous employers. He had failed out uh, really during training at two, two employers uh, as he came along, not including Atlas Air, of the six employers that he had worked for, there were documented problems, uh, proficiency problems, training problems at four of the six airlines that he had worked with prior to Atlas. Once he got to Atlas, he, uh, he had uh, training problems there, but nevertheless, uh, he was able to, uh, at some point, successfully complete a check ride. He had about 500, a little over 500 hours in the airplane. Captain had uh, many hours in the, in the uh, in the airplane, although only about 150 as captain. They're going into Houston. Uh, all of a sudden, the airplane just nosedives from 6,000 feet down into, into the Trinity Bay. What we determined was that uh, um, the airplane had gone through a little bit of turbulence. I mean, just a little bit of turbulence associated with the, uh, with the pre preceding the cold front. First officer had the speed brake out. And he's, he's guarding the speed brake with his left hand, holding it holding it as he's supposed to do. In the turbulence, he jostled, must have jostled his wrist a little bit, which activated, which pressed the go around uh, button on the throttle quadrant. Throttles uh, uh, advance to go around. The airplane pitches up to a pitch attitude to uh, command for 2,000 feet per minute uh, rate of climb. Co-pilot uh, apparently uh, sensed a 
somatic grab a collusion, push the nose down, thinking he was stalling. And if anyone's ever uh, experienced somatic grab collusion, it is very powerful. The way to overcome it is to have strong instrument skills and to fly your instruments, and that will help you to overcome that. But he basically pushed the nose down. Uh, at some point, the captain jumped on the controls. They opposed controls. Uh, but uh, by the time they both broke, well, they broke out of the clouds, they both commanded nose up elevator, but they pulled four Gs at the bottom, still, still so much inertia that the airplane uh, could not recover from that altitude. So very, very, very tragic situation. I think the real takeaway of that is that uh, in 2010, um, after the Colgan air crash, Congress mandated the FAA develop a pilot records database. Uh, they also appropriated money for the development of the pilot records database. That was in 2010. Um, we still don't have the pilot records database. We feel like if the FAA had put in place the pilot records database uh, as required by Congress, uh, this pilot would not have been hired by Atlas and therefore this accident would not have occurred. So in your investigation across the five different modes of transportation, um, there's obviously different levels of uh, historic sort of uh, accident rates across those different five. What, what, what do you see, uh, what's the difference? Why is there such a difference between those accident rates, say between one mode and another mode? Is it the safety standards that are there? Or, or what, what's the difference? Well, Terry, um, I think it's odd that since I've quit flying, aviation has gotten safer. I'm not sure if there's uh, anything to say about that. But the fact of the matter is, is uh, the aviation does a lot of things correctly, especially with the air carriers and some of the uh, uh, more formal business aviation departments. They've had an exceptional safety record. And, uh, and I, I attribute a lot of that to the work of organizations like RTCA and the GAJSC, the General Aviation Joint Steering Committee, and the the CAST, which you participated on heavily uh, for many years wearing a couple of different hats, Commercial Aviation uh, Safety Team, uh, ASIAS, the Aviation Safety Information Sharing System, uh, if, I, if I got that right, where you know, data awesome. analysis, focal programs, uh, all of those things together, the aviation industry does very well with. And so I think that that's, that, that speaks loudly uh, for what goes on uh, for the safety record there. You know? uh, so uh, we would like for the other modes to adopt things like safety management systems, which uh, all major carriers are doing. Like. So uh, I think that's kind of in a nutshell why there's a difference across across modes because aviation has adopted those things yeah exactly um every year you put out a uh, most wanted list um and you've been doing this now for yourself since 2006. i mean how do you how does the ntsb use that list uh, how have you seen that change over the years since you've been on the board yeah great question the NTSB started the most wanted list in 1990, and it's primarily an advocacy tool. Um, it is a tool that we use to, to say that these are areas that really need to be pushed over the hump. Uh, that, you know, we, we need to do more in these particular areas. Um, the GAO uh, completed a study of our most wanted list. They completed it uh, uh, in early part of the year. And they said that, I think they acknowledged that it is a, 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 an effective advocacy tool, but they wanted us to be more transparent in the way that we come up with those, uh, with those items. And I'll get a briefing tomorrow from our advocacy staff to talk about what, the, what tools we're putting in place to make sure that we really are more transparent. It's not just a crapshoot with a, we're going to put uh, put this on there or that, uh, but we do try to look for, for hot topic areas. Distractions is, is, a, is an example. We know distractions are prevalent in all modes of transportation. Fatigue is another area um, that uh, that is in, in all modes of transportation. Um, so 
we uh, we've narrowed the list a few years ago. We narrowed the list from it, could have been, it had at one time 22 items on it. How do you effectively advocate 22 items? So the list now contains no more than 10, and uh, the list now, instead of being an annual list, we do it uh, every other year. Um, so that's uh, uh, seven of the 10 items do have tentacles in aviation in some form, shape, or fashion. Great. Um, you mentioned human factors in your presentation, and I know you've been a pioneer in this area for, for as long as I've known you. Um, been a lot of talk about uh, the role of human factors in the last year or so based on some other accidents. Um, what, what are some of your thoughts with regard to changing roles of, of human factors, perhaps in the design process, certification, as well as in the operations and maintenance area? You know, we uh, we did make recommendations related to to some to some human factors issues related to the 737 Max. As as you and and your viewers know, the NTSB was not the lead investigative agency on either of those two two crashes. Uh, the state of occurrence, uh, both uh, Ethiopia and Indonesia, uh, they had the jurisdiction to investigate those accidents since they occurred in their country. Nevertheless, since the 737 is manufactured in the United States, we have an entree into those investigations by international treaties. And so we did find that there were some human factors issues related to uh, that, uh, to the design certification of that aircraft. And, uh, and we came out in September, late September of this past year with seven recommendations related to that. So uh, we do, think that there's areas that can be improved in that. And I'm, you know, I'll be glad to chat more about that if, um, if you like. Um, yeah, well, so what were some of those those uh, recommendations? Well, the, um, we, 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 we figured that manufacturers need to come up with, with better assumptions, and, and, and specifically in the case of the 737 MAX. When Boeing was doing a risk assessment to look at the notion of MCAS activation, uh, they had test pilots in the simulator, and then, you know, then all of a sudden the trim starts moving uh, without being commanded. So they want, they waited to see how is the pilot going to react. And of course, a pilot, if you have a, a trim that's moving that you don't expect it to, you would take the appropriate action. You would. Uh, grasp and hold the control wheel to oppose it and then uh, reach down and cut the, activate the stab trim cutout switches so that you know Boeing could say well a pilot can 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 handle this with no problem um, but what they did not take into account for is that uh, the situations that occurred in each of those two accidents and that is the MCAS activation occurred due to erroneous uh, angle attack input uh, and therefore, there's a lot of other things going on. There might be overspeed warnings going on. There might be uh, stall warnings going on. There will be other um, other lights, other alerts that are uh, eliminating, possibly enunciating orally in the cockpit. So we felt that the assumptions that Boeing used in uh, certifying uh, the MCAS uh, were not really, and of course the FAA ultimately cert certifies it, it's not Boeing that certifies it, but the, the assumptions that Boeing used in the certification process were not, were not entirely valid in that area. So we feel that, that, that that's an area there that could be improved. We don't want there to be just test pilots that are, that are being used for, for these purposes. We want there to be a, a broad spectrum of of pilots from across the world, pilots who will be expected to operate these airplanes. Uh, we feel like there, there should be better human factors uh, validation of the assumptions that are being used. So there's, those are just some of the areas right there. Um, kind of going into a new area here, uh, last month in our webinar we had Wayne Monteith from the FAA's Office of Commercial Space. Um, you back in 2014 did the investigation of the Spaceship 2 breakup over the Mojave Desert. Um, kind of a new mode of transportation maybe for the, for the uh, MTSB. Uh, what were some of the challenges you faced as you got involved with that, that, that accident? 
Yeah, great, great question, and a great, uh, great uh, webinar last last month. Uh, so thanks for doing that. Um, the truth of the matter is, NTSB has uh, been involved in commercial space accidents for over thirty years. Back in nineteen ninety three, uh, there was a um, uh, almost thirty years. Um, there was a uh, an orbital. Sciences uh, Pegasus Pegasus launch, as I recall, it was being launched from a from an aircraft, and uh, as it, as it uh, launched, it uh, was something catastrophic with it. So we we led the investigation on that. We've also been involved with uh, with the investigations, although we didn't lead it. We've been invest involved in the investigations of each of the shuttle crashes. We've uh, we've been involved with the uh, several launch failures or, or explosions. So it, it's not, and, and then as you mentioned, the spaceship too in 2014. Um, we believe that we have the authority to investigate uh, commercial space just through our, um, our, our statute, which is, uh, you know, the, uh, section 1131 of our, of our statute, you know, our enabling legislation says that we can investigate other accidents related to the transportation of individuals or property. Uh, our, we have a legal opinion that says that we have the jurisdiction to do that. We would like to see that more clearly spelled out in our legislation and uh, so that we're, we're not being challenged on that. Um, um, so we would like to see clarification, you know, in our, in, a, in our enabling legislation, it does say, you know, aircraft accident, rail accidents, marine accidents, but it does not specifically say uh, commercial space. So that's, that's a challenge we'd like to see uh, uh, clarified right there. Um, we're going to hear from Pete Bunsen a little bit on, on some of the, uh, the, the changes that are going on with different uh, modes, different forms of transportation, and uh, you know, whether it's urban air mobility, drone package deliveries, uh, electric propulsion systems, all these things are really changing the, the landscape of uh, the aviation ecosystem. How's the NTSB preparing for all of that? Great question. And we get questions like this a lot. You know, what's NTSB doing about drones? What's NTSB doing about a, a building that's being uh, built in the approach path of an airport or things like that? What are we doing about urban air mobility? And the reality is, I'll go back to that legislation that I mentioned before. It's uh, Title 49 of the U.S. Code, uh, uh, Section 1131. Is our, that's our authority. That's our authority spelled out by Congress. For the most part, Terry, as you know, we are an accident investigation agency. We're not a regulatory agency. Uh, that falls to the FAA or to the Federal Railroad Administration or whoever it happens to be. So we are an accident investigation agency. We are not, by design, accident investigation is not proactive. By design, we are really a reactive agency. So, so we're not going to be out there on the forefront of helping to develop uh, standards, and that's why we rely on organizations like RTCA to be involved in that from the front end, from developing those standards. But once there, if there is an accident, then we will come in and perform the independent accident investigation um, to to point out where where things can be improved. Great. Well, I don't want to ho hog all the time because I'm sure we have some questions from the audience. But again, for any of you that have joined us late, you're, you're hearing from the Honorable Robert L. Sumwalt, Chairman of the NTSB. So, uh, Al, do we have any questions from the audience? Boy, do we. Uh, oh, Chairman, a very popular fellow. It looks like a lot of people have questions for him. My internet's kind of fading out here, too. <laughs> uh, 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 related to the, to the topic uh, that you just closed, uh, Chairman, um, the NTSB is, uh, seems to focus on, on reactive technology like CVR, FDR, and other types of flight recording devices as a way of improving safety. Uh, why isn't the NTSB doing more to promote proactive technologies to prevent accidents, such as electronic stability and protection and helicopter stability augmentation systems that can prevent the loss of control in a flight accident? Well, I, I think we I think we do. Um, you know, we look at it on a on a case by case back uh, case by case basis. If we see that something like that needs to be implemented, we will make a recommendation for that. Um, so, 
I think that's the long and the short of it there. Uh, but yes, we do also want very good, we would much rather prevent the accident in the first place. There's no question about that. Uh, we have called for safety management systems across uh, most of the modes of transportation. So there's another proactive way. Uh, yesterday, we made a recommendation for auto GCAS, auto, automatic ground collision avoidance um, technology. So that, uh, that is, as Pete can talk about, it's being used in, in, uh, in fighter aircraft. Uh, so if the airplane uh, aircraft is about to hit the ground, uh, the airplane would recover on its own. So I think there's a good example right there, a strong example of uh, preventative technology that we're pushing the, uh, the envelope on. We'd like to see that uh, a study done to see how practical that could be in commercial aviation. Okay, here's another question. Uh, in other countries, uh, they seem to divide the transport uh, modes uh, amongst agencies. Do you feel that the wider remit of the NTSB adds cross transportation value or are there pros and cons to both approaches? Well, I imagine, uh, you know, really um, from a regulatory point of view, they are separate. They're all under the DOT, Federal Railroad Administration, Federal Highway Administration, Federal Aviation Administration, um, you know, we're independent from all of that. Now, I guess they're talking about as an accident investigation authority, are there, are there um, advantages to being all together? And, and I think that there are so that you can share resources. Uh, SMS in a railroad uh, is, is, is fundamentally probably not too different from SMS or risk management in the aviation arena. So I think that you get economies of scale by being all together. You can share HR, your human resources department. You can share your financial uh, financial functions. Um, so I, we do believe that the way that Congress has set us up is, uh, is a good model. But that's not to say um, that other models uh, aren't also good. But I think it's working very well for us. Okay, here's another one. Um, including the FAA in a probable cause statement seems to be rare. Does the board discuss doing this with the agency ahead of time? Uh, and if so, what is the agency's response? Well, um, in, in maybe some cases we might. We don't make it a policy statement. Yesterday, uh, the FAA was not in the draft probable cause. Uh, but I did introduce the FAA as a contributing cause to the accident. I uh, did that during the board meeting, and all five board members so we unanimously adopted that. So um, sometimes, uh, the re well, of course, the report is not complete until the board has voted on it. Uh, there are cases uh, where last year we were going to release a report on the uh, on a Navy vessel. It was the USS John McCain that had... Uh, that uh, was uh, struck by another, by a commercial vessel. Uh, I did go to the Pentagon and briefed the Secretary of the Navy, briefed the, uh, chief, uh, the Chief of Naval Operations and the Vice Chief. I briefed all three of them to tell them as a courtesy of what to expect. I'll do the same, uh, I've done the same with the Coast Guard Commandant, the head of the, the Coast Guard, to tell him what's going on. Um, we, we don't usually do that with the, with the DOT modal agencies. Uh, we don't expect them to agree. And uh, we, you know, I'd, I'd probably prefer not to brief them ahead of time because um, I don't, I don't want to pre-assume what my colleagues on the board are going to say. In each of those cases that I just mentioned, uh, the board had already voted on it and, uh, and, and the reports had not been released. So we, we don't usually call the FAA administrator or somebody over there and tell them what we're, what we're going to do. Okay, one other question. Uh, actually, there, there are several more. Um, but uh, the next one is uh, finding technically qualified individuals is always a challenge for organizations. What is the NTSB doing to attract qualified and enthusiastic folks into your workforce? Fortunately, we don't have a problem there. The NTSB is an organization that people want to work for. 
I remember a few years ago, actually it's been several years ago, we, we had two openings for our air safety investigators. I believe we got over 400 applications. And, uh, and I think that, uh, that that tells you right there. Now, now, how many of those are people that, would, that, that we would actually consider qualified? I mean, I think that, that uh, you know, friends of mine that, that, that flew with the airline say, hey, I'd, I'd want to work for the, for the NTSB. Uh, but just because you flew airplanes, does that necessarily mean that you'd be, be best for a field investigator uh, going out and kicking tin? Uh, you know, but we, it, the NTSB is an organization that people want to work for. We're one of the best places to work in the federal government. So uh, generally speaking, we don't uh, have problems recruiting. Pipeline Arena has been one that we have had problems with historically because the, uh, uh, the pipeline industry has paid uh, more, a lot more than the government pays. And so we were finding that, that it was hard to recruit in that arena. But uh, of course, we know the price of oil now is, uh, is down and the oil companies are shutting down wells and all. So, so that's not as much of a problem now as it, one, it had been at one time. Okay, um, and there's a question here about safety audits to voluntary standards. Can you give your observations of what works and what doesn't work? I'm a big believer of voluntary standards. Uh, I think that historically, when, when, when you can develop uh, performance-based standards and audit to those standards, uh, that's a good thing. The government doesn't have to be the answer to everything. And so I like the idea of accreditation organizations or auditing organizations where somebody can put their good housekeeping seal of approval, if you will, uh, on their website to say that we've met this standard. What I have noticed is that we have seen audits where people might receive a gold accreditation, for example. But what does that really mean? In the case of this particular auditing organization, gold, the, to get that, it was really a paperwork, organiz, uh, paperwork exercise. They didn't actually go on scene, on site, to conduct an audit. It was just like, well, do you have this? Do you have that? Do you have this and that? And the way I look at it is gold is a pretty high standard. We have athletes that compete for gold. They go to the Olympics to compete for gold. Would we just say, well, we're not going to have the Olympics anymore. We're just going to have everybody compete in their own country and tell us, uh, tell us how they did and send them out. Uh, and we'll award the highest one a gold medal. We don't do that. We actually go on site and we have, we have the Olympics where people compete. So I think that it's important that these standards actually have to mean something. Uh, we saw a, a Gulf Stream, a G4 crash a few years ago, 2014. Uh, we found all kinds of problems with that organization, including the fact that the pilots hadn't even done a full flight control check in something like 174 of the past 176 flights. Uh, they weren't using checklists. And yet, from their uh, audit that they had two years earlier, and by the way, they were going for another audit three days after the crash, which didn't happen, um, they received outstanding comments on their safety management, their proactive approach, their by-the-book operations. And so, so as a friend of mine said, John Fenton once said, you can, you can fool the auditors, but never fool yourself. And I think that's what's key in this particular case. You've got to be in the right compliant mindset uh, when you invite the auditors in. It's, it shouldn't be just a, a box checking exercise to try and get, get more business, for example. Yeah, I got uh, just two more questions and we'll kind of wind things up. Um, internationally, I mean, RTC is an international organization. We work with a lot of uh, uh, other organizations across the globe. How does the NTSB interact with some of the other investigative agencies around the world? Very carefully. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, uh, to break some news here for you. So um, um, we do have a very good relationship with the, with the larger accident investigation agencies across the globe uh, every year. Didn't do it this year because of the pandemic, but we do meet uh, um, across the globe. Last year it was in Quebec City. The year before that it was in 
Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan. Uh, the year before that it was in Japan, but the International Transportation Safety Association does meet and we, we get we compare best practices. Um, we, um, as you know, the uh, in January, the uh, there was a uh, an apparent shoot down of a, of a of an airliner in uh, in Iran, and it was wondering where the black boxes would go. Uh, they are now in in France. It's been agreed upon that the EEA uh, will read out the boxes and we will send an investigator uh, to be a part of the readout of those uh, recordings, assuming that we can get State Department and EU uh, approval. As you know, the EU has imposed a, a basically a, a restriction on people from the US traveling to Europe right now. So assuming we can get all the authorizations from uh, the appropriate uh, authorities. We will send an investigator to to participate in that in that readout. So we we do have a good relationship uh, with the accident investigation authorities throughout the globe. Thank you for that question. And just one last question: um, Is there any one thing that keeps you awake at night? Well, I, I don't drink coffee usually, so I can't blame that. But there is a lot that keeps me awake. And of course, right now, uh, just worrying about the agency. Uh, you know, I, my biggest priority, somebody asked me the other day, what's your biggest priority? And frankly, my biggest priority right now is making sure that our employees are safe and worrying about their well-being through this uh, horrible situation that we're dealing with now. We're doing very thorough risk assessments before we send someone uh, somewhere. We're not going to a lot of accidents. Uh, we have gotten a lot done uh, during the shutdown. Uh, since the first, for the first six months of this year, we have completed 920 accident reports across all modes. 920 reports, so that shows that we are being productive. But unfortunately, we're not going to many accidents these days. We will have to then go back and, and get those done. Uh, I do worry about the timeliness of some of our reports. And we have, um, um, we have put in place, we did a, a lean, six, six, lean Six Sigma approach to, to our processes and spent a good bit of time looking at the processes and then develop, developing new processes and procedures to improve the timeliness of our reports. We had rolled that out. We went to Oshkosh. Oshkosh is a great time to be in the summer. Can't be there next week. Uh, uh, can't be there next next week or the week after. But I was there in March when we got all of our investigators together in the aviation mode uh, at the museum there, the EAA. It's a great time to be there because nobody else is there. You've got the whole museum to yourself. But um, we, we, we did the training for our pilot, for our investigative groups on how we were changing things to improve the timeliness and effectiveness and efficiency of our, of our reporting. Um, unfortunately, uh, a few days later, a, a, a global pandemic was declared. So, you know, I worry about the health and well-being of our employees. I worry about the timeliness of our reports. Uh, but generally, uh, I think uh, the NTSB is in, is in good shape, but we want to be better. And we're always striving to be better. Well, thank you so much, Chairman. Um, as usual, you never fail to educate and inspire an audience, and I know you're very busy, and I sincerely appreciate the time that you took to spend with us today. I know um, everyone probably enjoyed hearing from you as much as I did, so thank you very much. Well, don't call me Chairman. You've always called me Robert, so uh, <laughs> don't, don't, don't start now. But uh, yeah, I look forward to sticking around to see what uh, what Pete, Pete's going to say. All right. Great. Thanks thank for you. having me. Appreciate it. Bye. Take care. Bye. Well, every year, um, one of the, the thrills we have at RTCA is to uh, recognize some special people. Um, RTCA supports the aviation industry by providing minimum operating performance standards that serve as the basis for government certification of equipment that is used in the tens of thousands of aircraft flight flying daily through the, the world's airspace. But the core of RTCA is the people. It's the hundreds of 
dedicated individuals from, from the United States and really around the world that, that come, to, to come together to develop these comprehensive industry vetted and endorsed recommendations. So every year we, we do present some awards to some of our special committee members that have made some significant contributions to our TCA standards development and the documents that come from those. So I'd like to invite Al Season back on to make a presentation for a set of three committee awards for this month. Al? Thank you very much, Terry. As I mentioned uh, in the opening for this webinar, uh, today we recognize our first round of RTCA award winners for exceptional work in standards development. These individuals were selected by the leadership of their committees for extraordinary work in the development of RTCA standards documents. Our first two award winners uh, are from uh, Special Committee 147, Traffic Collision and Avoidance Systems. Uh, this committee, established originally in 1980, has defined and updated the TCAS performance standards to evolve them into the Airborne Collision Avoidance System X, or ACAS X. Uh, the document pair of DO385 Volume 1, which is the Minimum Operational Performance Standards for Airborne Collision Avoidance System X, ACAS XA and XO, that's a mouthful, and Volume 2, the accompanying algorithm design document, represents significant advances in aviation by defining the minimum performance of the system acting as a last resort method of preventing mid-air collisions or near mid-air collisions between aircraft. By utilizing surveillance information from secondary surveillance radar and ADSB technology, ACAS-X equipment operates independently of ground-based aids and air traffic control. Being recognized for her significant contributions towards DO-385 are Barbara kobsik jewell of the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. Congratulations, Barbara, and thank you very much. And a significant contributor award is Donna Frillick of Aurora Innovations. Congratulations, Donna, and thank you very much. Our next committee award is from Special Committee 186, Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast, ADSB. Originally established in 1995, this committee develops minimum performance standards for airborne and ground user applications of ADSB. Over 70 ADSB operational capabilities have been identified that could provide enhanced safety, increased capacity, and improved efficiency to the national airspace. In April of 2019, change one to DO317B, minimum operational performance standards for aircraft surveillance applications systems appendix U, was released that describes specific aircraft track data used for ADSB traffic advisory systems testing. This data is crucial for verifying and validating the implementations of ASA systems by industry. Being recognized by SC 186 for outstanding leadership in the development of this document is Miles Bellman of the Volpe National Transportation Systems Center. Congratulations, Miles, and thank you. The first awardee for significant contributions to this document is Jason Liu, also of the Volpe National Transportation System Center. Thank you, Jason, and congratulations. The second significant contributor award for this committee is Katie Bernazani of the Department of Transportation. Congratulations, Katie, and thank you for your work. Today's final set of awards is from Special Committee 228, Minimum Performance Standards for Unmanned Aircraft Systems. Established in May of 2013, this committee is developing the Minimum Operational Performance Standards for Detect and Avoid Equipment and Command and Control Data Link Solutions using various frequencies. In March of 2019, the committee published DO-377, Minimum Aviation System Performance Standards for command and control link systems supporting operations of unmanned aircraft systems in U.S. airspace that describes a command and control link system allowing unmanned aircraft to operate both within line of sight and beyond line of sight of a ground control station. Being awarded the Outstanding Leadership Award for this document is Jim Williams of JHW Unmanned Solutions. Congratulations, Jim, and thank you so much for your leadership. 
The award for significant contributor recognizes Dr. Marvin Hammond of Technology Providers. Congratulations, Marv, and thank you for your excellent work. Join us in one month as we recognize other individuals for their work on RTCA committees and in producing documents that advance the safety and efficiency of the aviation system. Back to you, Terry. Thanks, Al, and again, congratulations to this month's award winners. I, I just continue to be in awe and so impressed with the work that gets done on these committees and all, all in the effort of, of making our aviation system uh, even better and safer than it is today. So thank you and congratulations to everyone. Uh, as Val mentioned again, next month we'll be recognizing another set of committee members, so I'm anxious to hear who those winners are too. I want to take just a moment again to uh, thank our sponsors for today's event. Um, even in these difficult times, these organizations have been gracious enough to uh, make today's webinar series happen. And also, as Al mentioned at the beginning, if you want to go to the handouts tab on the, the Big Marker platform, you can download some additional information uh, about our sponsors. So again, a, a shout out to Collins Aerospace, NBAA, American Airlines, AOPA, Garmin, and Gamma as supporters and sponsors for today's webinar. Uh, your continued support to the industry and RTCA is, is very much appreciated. So on the subject of Gamma, to conclude today's webinar, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Mr. Pete Bunce, President and Chief Executive Officer for the General Aviation Manufacturers Association. It's a position he's held since 2005. In his role, Pete engages with regulators, policymakers and elected officials to advance the interests of Gamma's global membership of more than 100 airframe, avionics, engine, and component manufacturers, as well as the world's leading business aviation maintenance, repair, and overall companies. Uh, Pete's a true icon in the, in the aviation industry, both here in Washington, D.C., but also around the world. In fact, in 2010, Pete was inducted as one of the 70 living legends of aviation, a well-deserved honor and I'm very happy to have him here today. Pete? Well, thank you, Terry. It's an honor to be with you, and it's an honor to be on the same uh, platform as uh, the chairman there. In fact, I was very glad to hear Robert talk about his support of standards, and obviously the work that RTCA does uh, for standards development are, is absolutely paramount to where we want to go at this period of aviation. Um, as is no surprise to anyone, the entire industry right now got the gut punch from the COVID-19 and whether we're talking to commercial airlines, manufacturers, any organization worldwide that's dealing with aviation right now is feeling some pain. But what I'm going to focus on, to now, uh, on now is really the bright spot in aviation. And if you think about where we're going with advanced air mobility and the companies that are, that are actually working in this field, it's pretty fascinating that they are still in the development process. So during this COVID period where we've seen layoffs uh, across the board in a lot of the industries and may have quite a few more uh, coming up, these companies are still uh, moving forward. They've got investment dollars working for them. They've got a considerable burn rate of money, but this is what they would have been doing had COVID-19 uh, not approached uh, a process as it did. So. I am still extremely bullish on what is happening with advanced air mobility. And as I've mentioned in several different forums, I think this is the most exciting time to be involved in civil aviation since the dawn of the jet age. It's truly phenomenal uh, what is happening in this field. And I hope to be able to touch on a few of those today. So as just to kind of level set all of us, if we're looking at what the population is of just aircraft that are out there today uh, worldwide and you look at the piston aircraft uh, dominating that uh, that space there and then the number of commercial airliners business jets turboprops rotorcraft and then you look at you just u.s registered uas is alone at over one and a half million vehicles out there just that are registered we can tell what's happening with technology and how quickly it's it's advancing and right now we do not have any certified and operating advanced air mobility vehicles. But the good news is we've got several of them that are in the flight test phase now. So they are actually in test areas 
flying and we're very excited about what's happening. But kind of let's look at the worldwide distribution of those aircraft right now. And it's very obvious that the majority of all the aircraft that are out there flying today, and this is with the, uh, this, uh, this doesn't include the number of UASs out there. The predominance is in North America. Why? Because we have the infrastructure, we have the freedom to fly here in North America that other parts of the world don't enjoy. And that really was brought home uh, during the COVID uh, situation where across Europe, business and general aviation was basically grounded. Country by country, they just said no and, and stopped it and put it on the ground. Unfortunately, we do not have that same impediment uh, to being able to, to do transport and do it safely here in North America. So let's talk about disruptive change for a second. Let's go in the Wayback Machine here to Fifth Avenue in New York City. Now, those of the, you that have been in New York during the COVID pandemic, uh, same here in Washington, D.C., it's pretty easy to drive around compared to what it is normally. But if you look back in 1900 on Fifth Avenue, I want you to notice something, that if you, if you look closely, every one of those vehicles on a very busy avenue uh, is a horse-drawn vehicle except for one in the picture the red circle indicates one automotive vehicle now see how quickly that changed in 1913 same street can you spot the one horse-drawn vehicle it's right there so in 13 years on easter morning that's how quickly things have changed now have we seen this recently in aviation well, yeah, we have. When we transitioned to glass cockpits, the transition happened absolutely just in, in what I would consider in lightning pace. I mean, in five years, virtually no new aircraft in the piston market, turboprops, business jets, wasn't built with a glass cockpit unless the customer just wanted to order steam gauges because they were interested in seeing uh, just flying in a traditional manner. But now let's look at the vehicles themselves. And this is not fully representative of all the gamma companies that are working with electric and hybrid propulsion, but I just picked a few of them here to take a look at the different designs that are out there. Some of them look like a traditional aircraft. Some of them do not. Some of them look like a, a traditional rotorcraft. Some of them do not. One thing that's important to note that most of them are producing lift off of the fuselage and different structures that that hold the electric propulsors out there uh, that distinguish them from a rotorcraft as well as the fact that none of them can auto rotate they don't have the rotor mass to be able to do that so that Im that impacts how we certify these vehicles and how we are going to move forward now picture aircraft that i don't have pictured here are traditional aircraft that we're working on right now. We have companies like uh, Ampere that's got a uh, Cessna Skymaster that they're using uh, to develop technology. We, a, a lot of us have looked at um, uh, Magna X and seen what they're doing with float plane beavers out there and electrifying those. We've got Dyer Airbus and uh, Saffron working on an EcoPulse that has propulsors on the front uh, wings, several of them, uh, of a standard TBM aircraft. And um, uh, Zero Avia is working with a, a Piper, I think it's a Malibu or Meridian, uh, working with hydrogen fuel cell technology. And then you add to it, uh, the first all-electric airplane was just certified by Pipistro. Uh, so we have that on the books, and that's closely going to be followed by the Bi-Aerospace E-Flyer. Both two outstanding training aircraft where we'll be able to do a lot of circuits within the pattern on the battery charge to be able to give student pilots that that good experience with takeoff and landing in a much less costly form because they're using electric propulsion so this is real it's happening and i think that people get really surprised when they find out that there are six what we now call advanced air mobility vehicles that are quote well along uh, on the certification path. So it, it is happening fast. And as I mentioned, a lot of these vehicles are, are actually in test flights right now, both manned and unmanned. Uh, we have considerable investment coming into the industry. Uh, Toyota was a big investor, uh, almost $400 million going toward Joby. And of course it was big news that Hyundai 
uh, partner with Uber to be able to push the flying taxi concept. So uh, the automotive manufacturers see a lot of promise in being able to look toward advanced air mobility as a future frontier for them. And if you think about the problem that, that we have in being able to have electric vehicles operating in the airspace, it's actually working in three dimensions. It's easier to do it in two dimensions where you have to integrate both uh, legacy cars with the new cars that are talking to one another. And as we develop the standards to be able to have vehicles talk and to be able to have these air vehicles sense and avoid other vehicles out there, our problem, because we have a three-dimensional uh, airspace uh, to be able to have the luxury to work in, actually becomes an easier problem than a lot of the mo automotive uh, companies have working. So let's look at some of the challenges that we have in, in front of us. Um, if you look at pilot training and certification to enable this technology, one of the things that, that we've got to do is we've got to look at it from a standpoint of how simple these vehicles are to fly. If we go down a pathway, and, and we anticipate that right now, what we are pushing for is that each one of the pilots in the initial phase, uh, whether they're operating the aircraft in the vehicle itself or operating the aircraft through a ground station, that they have a private pilot certificate. And that's a good starting place. But over time, we need to adapt that. Having flown a couple of these vehicles now in the simulators, I can tell you it's the simplest thing any any teenager you could take with a joystick could actually fly some of these aircraft if they actually had to fly it out of its uh, autonomous mode. And it, it's so simple. And there are some out there that are arguing that, well, we need a private pilot certificate and we need to have a rotorcraft certificate. And you sit there and you go, that would so hinder this, this new technology out there to require. And that's such overkill by a vast amount. Because again, the, these vehicles, they can't auto rotate anyway. They don't, they aren't like a traditional rotorcraft. So it's crazy to, to even think that we need to go that route. So we're working very carefully with the authorities, both the FAA and EASA primarily, to be able to look at what kind of training do we need for these folks uh, to be able to safely operate the machine. Uh, if you look at the infrastructure readiness, out there, there is great work being done now on the Vertiport concept, but one of the things that we feel we are lagging behind on is the energy grid viability. It takes a lot of energy to go ahead and charge these vehicles. And if you look at, if you plan to charge them in an urban environment, we all know what type of planning cycles it takes to dig up asphalt and be able to lay lines and be able to put big power structures into existing or new buildings that are out there. We do have a network of airports, reliever airports around big cities throughout the world that are prime ground where we can easily or much more easily lay cable uh, to be able to go and provide the energy needs that we will need to recharge these vehicles. Because most of them, we're talking a rapid recharge in 20 minutes. Uh, we will have to be able to have a way to cool the batteries and cool the systems as we go ahead and recharge at those power levels. So it's a significant problem that, that we're working with. And of course, merging the concepts, the CONOPS for these vehicles, both unmanned and manned, along with the existing commercial and general aviation that's out there, along with military aviation, is obviously a challenge that we're all working on now but it has to be done in an integrated fashion. So just to, to touch on those a little bit more, if you're looking at who actually controls the aircraft, you know, again, some of them will have a pilot on board, although we'll most likely on a pre-programmed route. But if you look at what some of us have called the tube concept, let's say you were talking in, a, in class B airspace where they're departing from an urban location or perhaps even a commercial uh, a large, uh, hub airport, they go out and once they get out underneath the inverted uh, wedding cake, the structure that we see in a class B, now you have more freedom of movement and most of these aircraft will be on pre-programmed routes. It'll be very predictable for ATC, but they still will be then operating out when you're working underneath the class B with other aircraft that are out there, whether it's at the low altitude structure in transition down below 400 feet with UASs, or when they're just operating above 
400 feet with other aircraft that are operating underneath the class B rotorcraft and fixed wing. So there is a lot of integration that has to be done. Now, a lot of people have, have gone and said, well, UTM is going to solve this. And obviously we are big proponents of what's happening with UTM, but we also have to be realistic that what works for the UES is down below 400 feet and all of that communication that's going back and forth between the vehicles themselves will overwhelm controllers in in the typical way we control traffic in this day and age so as we have utm and it's progressing we're going to have to transition and have these vehicles that are operating at least above 400 feet integrating into the normal air traffic management system so it's going to be very important that we work this problem and work it carefully and we've got great organizations RCC is working on standards. We've got MITRE working on it alongside the FAA, working very closely to be able to go and figure out how we're going to integrate advanced air mobility into, into this system and do it very safely. And then the communications piece. We have to have an ability to be able to trans, transmit the ones and zeros very efficiently, and 5G gives us that capability to be able to do it. One of the things that we worry about, and we know that our friends in Congress are very cognizant of being able to preserve spectrum for all types of modes of mobility, whether it's ground transportation or air transportation, to be able to go and use the great capability of 5G to be able to have that spectrum that's carved out for transportation preserved and not sold off so that we can make sure that we can leverage that properly. And that is something that we all need to be cognizant of as we move forward and uh, support those supporters that we have in Congress to be able to preserve that piece of the spectrum for us. It's a little different problem when you have vehicles in the air traveling with closing velocities in excess of 200 knots, uh, and that's at the low end, just with Doppler shift and everything else that you're dealing with than you would have with cars working on the surface. So our spectrum is very important in that regime to be able to go and, and keep working, working towards solutions there. So I'm gonna gonna wrap it up uh, just for time's sake. I could talk about this obviously for hours. Uh, I look forward to the questions that you might have, but I think Leonardo had it had it right a long, long time ago that when he looked up in the sky and just said, "Look at what could be." And we're just scratching the surface right now of what this revolution in aviation will look like. And we all know uh, the environment is very important to all of us. Uh, Europe, the pressure is extensive on all areas of commercial aviation. And so as we work things like uh, sustainable aviation fuel, uh, work hydrogen and other areas that we go and try to be more environmentally sustainable and, and in the term in Europe decarbonization, urban and advanced air mobility gives us great promise at least to be able to transport people. Not We're not talking having a technology to, to of a, a large aircraft at this time, but in the near, very near future, we'll have the capability to transport people with smaller vehicles in a very, very sustainable and, and efficient manner using electric and hydrogen fuel cell propulsion. So with that, Terry, turn it back over to you. Hey, thanks, Pete. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any time for questions, but just a couple of comments. Uh, one is uh, we, uh, we're we really excited here at RTC to be part of some of this new development because a lot of the members that uh, you have that are working on this have come to be part of the RTCA family. And I know Al Season and I went out to the Bay Area uh, last year and got to fly one of those simulators and I agree it was was uh, very intuitive to to maneuver the vehicle um, and also I agree um, just the excitement about this the what's going on in the industry now right now and it's you know it's the same sort of atmosphere uh, that I had as a teen when I was a teenager that really inspired me to go into this industry so it is a very exciting time and uh, for the young folks just getting started, it's just an amazing, a lot of amazing opportunities out there right now. So again, thanks, Pete. Um, so this does conclude today's webinar. Uh, again, my sincere appreciation to um, Robert Sumwalt and Mr. Pete Bunce for your valuable con uh, contributions and the participation this afternoon. 
and also again, congratulations to our committee award winners. And again, I want to do a shout out to thank our sponsors one more time for today's webinar, Collins Aerospace, the National Business Aviation Association, American Airlines, the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, Garmin, and the General Aviation Manufacturers Association. And again, remember to go to that handout tab on this platform to get some more information about our sponsors. And to the audience, thank you for joining us today. I know we had a large group of, uh, from all over the world that had uh, uh, signed up to be a part of today. And I, I do hope that you found today's presentations educational, inspiring, and evolving. Please join us again next month on August 19th, again at 1 o'clock p.m. And we're going to feature a panel on something that Pete brought up. I didn't actually set him up for this, but it's also been something that's been in the news a lot lately and that's the aviation radio frequency spectrum access. It's something that is so vital to everything that our industry designs and operates. The, the impact of new technologies like 5G have the potential to impact our current systems using the same or adjacent frequency bands. And I think some of the things that will come out in that panel uh, were identified by Pete in his talk. Um, the panel is going to be led by Mr. Andrew Roy of Aviation Spectrum Resources and really promises to be a, a great one. We'll also include a tech talk from Mr. Pete DeMont, President and CEO of ATCA, the Air Traffic Control Association. So again, thank you all and have a great day.